Today, our topic uh, is, is automation. This is the beginning of the foundation on which a lot of AI artificial intelligence is built. Automation is an old idea, an old term. It goes way back in history, well long before there were electronic computers or anything. Uh, I can find references to the Greeks being interested in what we, today we might consider simple automation. They were interested in clocks, so they had some of the first clocks, which is a way of automating timekeeping. In the 1700s was a period of a lot of automation. Um, the beginning of the 1700s, uh, in, especially in France, there was a lot of uh, a booming textile business, and the, the, the French people invented the automatic looms to do the, run the machines that do the weaving and add the, the ability to weave patterns in by machines. That turned out to be very important because later the idea of the uh, punched cards that was used in some of the automated looms became uh, part of the design of computers. Another big uh, development in the 1700s was the engines, the steam engines, factory engines, pumps, railroad engines and other kinds of uses of engines, all sorts of automation started to arise around that. In the middle, uh, somewhat later in the 1800s, there was a famous uh, thing called the Mechanical Turk. I don't remember which country it was in. Mechanical Turk was a machine, or so many people thought it was a machine that played chess. So you could come up to this machine, turn it on, and play a game of chess, and often it would beat you. Well, this, this was a very popular uh, thing, but it, it, it was discovered to be a hoax around 1780, I believe. So it lasted for a few years and then got discredited. But it, it planted in people's minds the idea that a machine could do something intelligent. So in some ways, the, the notion of artificial intelligence was already on somebody's mind back in the 1700s. In the 1940s, as you know, we got started building electronic computers. Uh, almost immediately, people started thinking of the possibilities for doing intelligent things by computer. In the 1950s, for example, the newspapers frequently talked about computers as electronic brains. So, the idea that a computer had something to do with our brain was implanted early in the age of the electronic computing era. Well, today uh, we have uh, Professor Josh Kroll here to talk to you about automation. He's going to go over some of the history and, and point out some interesting things about automation. He's also going to point out uh, how uh, artificial intelligence has been changing automation. Uh, Josh first became known to us at NPS, I think it was in 2003, is that right? Yeah. Or 2004. He came to us as a, an intern. At that time, he was a senior in New York school in town. He was one of our favorite interns. And then he went off and he got, got a real education. He went to Harvard and then he went to Princeton, got his PhD at Princeton a few years ago. And now he's come back to the campus. And uh, he's particularly, over those, that time, he's become particularly interested in how computers cross over into other fields. So you'll hear some of that in his talk, a lot of his interest about how computers have affected other fields will show up. In recent times, he's also been working on computers crossing into the law field. So I don't know whether he has anything to say about that today, but that's one of his favorite topics. So I present to you, well, please welcome Dr. Josh Kroll. Well, thank you for the introduction, Peter. Um, I, I thought for a moment you were going to take all of my examples, but you only got about 30, 40% of them. I, I would also say that uh, I, I at least hope we, we are giving a, um, a, a, a real education here. I think so. Uh, before I get started talking about automation, I want to say that it's the first level of this AI hierarchy that you're discussing in this class, uh, and it is uh, one that I hope to convince you by the end of my time today uh, is fundamental to all the other layers and in some way contains all the other layers. Uh, before we get started, though, I'm curious how many people, by show of hands, 
have ever been to a McDonald's restaurant? Raise your hand. All right, I see that's almost everyone. Uh, so if you, go, if you went to the McDonald's brothers and you asked them what it was that made their restaurant different and special and uh, what was going to make them successful and make their restaurant uh, grow across the country and uh, what was going to uh, make their name famous uh, around the world, uh, it was not uh, the recipes or, or quality or some uh, change in logistics that made their restaurant more efficient and profitable. Uh, it was the fact that they had uh, built what they referred to as a fully automated kitchen under the guise of what they called the speedy system. And this system allowed them to cook their food and get it from the customer's order into the customer's hands in seconds rather than minutes. Uh, and so they felt that was a, a big uh, innovation in the restaurant business, something that would change the way that they did business, change the way that the industry did business uh, in a way that was useful. And what made the kitchen automated was not that it uh, functioned based on the use of uh, machines to cook the food or prepare the food. Uh, rather, what made the system automated was that the people who prepared the food were operating according to a set of established rules. And so this is going to be our working definition of automation today. That an automated process is a process that works according to an established set of rules. We call that set of rules a specification. Uh, and specifications can be explicit, meaning we actually go ahead and say what the rules are going to be. They can also be implicit for a number of reasons. Those are situations where the rules exist, but we don't say exactly what the rules are um, or how we got them. Maybe they came together because the system came together from a bunch of different stakeholders. Maybe we were using machine learning and we discovered a set of rules that worked well for a particular problem. I think you'll hear more about that later in the course. Um, note that this definition of automation does not rely on the complexity of the rule set. So you can automate very simple rules, and you can automate very complex rules, uh, or you can have very complex sets of rules which are made up of simple rules, and we'll see that as well. Also, the definition does not depend on how we embody that rule set. And so often when we talk about AI, we're thinking about embodying that rule set in a piece of software or a system that's based on software. There are other software systems, software controllers, for example, that uh, operate uh, and embody rules that uh, someone has developed for them to embody. Uh, but that's not the only way that we can embody a set of rules and automate something. We can automate something, as Peter was saying, using a mechanical system, a physical machine that embodies a set of rules. We can also embody a set of rules with a group of people, uh, which we often think of as a bureaucracy. I'll talk later about a different definition and earlier use of the word computer uh, to refer to teams of people. Um, and when we think about uh, embodying rules in groups of humans, that doesn't mean that all the humans in a process are necessarily functioning according to very explicit rules that can just be applied uh, equally in all cases. Sometimes humans are using their discretion or they're bound by rules at a different level of abstraction. Uh, and so the machine uh, is supporting the human or the set of rules, however it's embodied, is supporting some human who has more autonomy and discretion. Uh, and so uh, I put to you that there are very few, if not no, situations which are truly fully automated, either in the sense that there is a full set of rules that governs everything that's supposed to happen, uh, or in the sense that those rules are somehow embodied in a machine, uh, whether that machine is mechanical or in software or uh, a team of humans. Uh, and so today we're going to explore what it means to automate something. Uh, I'll dive into an example. Um, so uh, if you went back a couple hundred years and you asked people uh, whether uh, a machine could draw a picture, they would have said, no, only a human draftsman can draw a picture. Uh, to make a pen and ink picture of something, in this case a ship, would require uh, the, um, the flexibility of and the dexterity of a human, and a machine just couldn't do that. Uh, and so in, uh, in 1800, uh, a, a mechanician by the name of Henri Maillardet produced this machine. He was Swiss, but he was working in London. Uh, and this machine is a machine that draws pictures. Uh, he uh, managed to get it to draw eight different pictures. It can also write in French and in English. Uh, and this machine uh, drew the picture on the previous slide of the ship. Um, and 
uh, we would not say that this machine is intelligent. It's just operating according to a set of years. Nonetheless, it is doing something that people at the time thought required a human. Uh, and so it has taken that activity that a human could do and embodied it in a machine. Of course, because it's a machine, it can only produce those eight images that Meyerday set it up to produce. Uh, and it produces them the same way each time it produces them. Uh, Peter mentioned already the Jacquard looms, which are also machines that produce something, in this case cloth, cloth with elaborate patterns on it. Uh, those patterns are determined by uh, which threads are present in the weave at any particular uh, point, uh, also which threads are visible on one side of the fabric or the other. Uh, and those decisions about which threads to include and which threads to place on top uh, are encoded in these paper cards, these punched paper cards, which are fed into the machine and which control its mechanical operation to put the correct threads uh, into the weave at the correct moment to get the pattern that the operator wants. Again, we would not describe this machine as intelligent, although it is doing something that previously had been done by humans, setting the controls of a loom or weaving cloth by hand. Uh, another mechanical example of automation uh, is an autopilot. Uh, just curious, how many aviators in the room? Any aviators in the room? A few? All right. Um, so uh, the, on the right, you see uh, one of the early commercial autopilots from Sperry. Uh, Lawrence Sperry invented the autopilot and first demonstrated it in 1913 for the Navy. So he developed it uh, on contract for the Navy, believing that he could build a device that would keep a plane at a, a, an altitude, at a heading that he set, at a speed that he set. Uh, and so on the right, you see some naval aviators waiting for a test flight of a Sperry autopilot in a Curtis C-2, one of the Navy's earlier uh, planes. In one of those Sperry augmented Curtis C-2s in 1914, Sperry uh, demonstrated the autopilot at the Paris Air Show for commercial applications uh, by flying past a crowd and walking out on the wing to unbalance the plane. Uh, but uh, the plane, of course, keeps its heading because it has the autopilot. Um, you might also recognize this as the cockpit of a Boeing 777 passenger jet. It also has an autopilot. You see it there above the instrument panel below the window. Uh, this autopilot is much more capable, much more complicated than uh, the early gyroscopic autopilots. It can do a lot more than keep the plane on a particular heading at a particular speed and altitude that are set by the pilot. Um, but uh, even though it has much more complexity, we still wouldn't describe it as an intelligent device. It's just doing more of the pilot's job uh, and leaving uh, less work for the pilot or making the pilot more capable or free to do other kinds of activities. Um, so that brings me to the end of my section on mechanical uh, embodiments of automation. Uh, I talked earlier about how automation can also be embodied in groups of people. Um, bureaucracies, for example, or uh, computers. We, uh, so I'm a computer scientist. Peter is a computer scientist. There's a course about AI in the computer science department. Uh, we want to think about what are computers. Well, before we had electronic computers, we had teams of people who did computational tasks that we referred to as computers. Uh, so what computational tasks were done by these teams? Uh, um, one of great importance starting in the 18th century was the construction of logarithm tables for use in navigation. Um, there was a lot of concern about the accuracy of those tables. Uh, another was the computation of trajectory uh, data, so how much uh, angle and how much charge should you put in an um, artillery piece in order to hit something a certain distance away under certain conditions. Uh, and uh, so you, computers would use physical models to develop uh, tables for use by uh, gunners. Uh, and that, uh, again, was a computational task that required uh, teams of humans organized to, uh, to make it function. The computers in this photograph are at Bletchley Park in England uh, at an intelligence facility in World War II attempting to decrypt German communications. Uh, so the Allies knew how the German communications were uh, enciphered but they didn't know uh, what settings of the machine were used on a day-to-day -day basis. And the Germans changed those settings every day. And so every day, teams of computers would rush to turn intercepts that had been made by Allied ships uh, and planes out uh, in the field into actionable intelligence. 
Uh, if you've seen the movie The Imitation Game, you know that a mathematician by the name of Alan Turing was later brought onto this project to sort of further automate the work of these humans into a machine which did those computations, but much faster. Uh, and that just increased the ability of this intelligence station to produce actionable intelligence by decoding German messages. So I've talked about embodying uh, uh, rules in uh, mechanical devices, in teams of humans. Uh, today we're very interested in automating uh, things in software. And the thing about automating things in software is that uh, we are starting to find that there are sets of rules that exist that can do things that we would have previously classed outside the scope of what machines can do. Uh, these might be things like identifying objects in a photograph and classifying them for what they are, which is what you see here, but it might be other tasks too. Uh, understanding what a text document is about, transcribing spoken speech into text, um, translating a document in one language into a document in another language. These are all things that we have developed computer systems for. Again, these computer systems are just embodiments of rules. Uh, they're just automation. Uh, and because of that, we shouldn't consider these systems to be intelligent. In fact, uh, in some sense, the fact that we have machines that do these tasks robs us of the idea that these tasks are tasks that required intelligence that we used to think they required intelligence, that only a human could do these tasks, and we're finding no, actually, machines can do these tasks. Um, and uh, Peter mentioned as well that oftentimes when a machine is presented as intelligent, as doing some task that only a human can do, uh, often that is not by dint of the machine having a full set of rules which describe how to perform the task. Rather, it can be because a human intelligence is somehow mediated through the system. So uh, here on the left, you see uh, the Turk from Germany in 1770, um, which was a, an automaton like the Meyerday automaton that drew pictures, um, which came shortly after. Uh, it, but it was an automaton that played chess and played chess well. And it could also perform uh, what was called a knight's tour of the chessboard, where you start a knight on one square and you move it according to the night rules and eventually you get to every square on the chessboard without visiting any square you visited before. Um, and so that was thought to be uh, a sort of a neat party trick uh, for this thing. Of course, this machine was not a machine that knew how to play chess or perform a knight's tour. Um, it was a machine where a human was hiding in the cabinet on the lower right side of the cabinet and operating the automaton via uh, some controls and the human was playing chess, but to the user of the machine, it appeared that the machine was playing chess. Uh, these systems are common. They exist still today. We often refer to them as Wizard of Oz systems because in order to believe that the system has intelligence, uh, you must pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Um, and so this, as I said, this happens today, right? If you interact with a chatbot, often there's a human on the other side of that chatbot and it's just presented to you as a chatbot. Um, Things like the Ring doorbell from Amazon was recently discovered by some journalists to not in fact be automatically detecting whether a person is at your door, but in fact is showing video to some operators who are determining whether someone is at your door. Uh, so that's, uh, that's something interesting. But again, we see this, this paradigm. So this paradigm uh, is an old paradigm to make machines seem more intelligent than they actually are and maybe to bridge the gap between the rules we know how to automate today and the rules we want to be able to automate. Um, one thing I think that that makes us think about is how to uh, break down where in a problem automation is useful. Uh, and so that makes me think of Amazon distribution centers. These are photographs from inside an Amazon distribution center. Uh, and Amazon has developed these nifty little robots which can drive around the distribution center, find the shelves that have the items on them that people have ordered that need to be picked for the order. Uh, and the robots can get under the shelf, find the right place to engage a screw mechanism on the top of the robot that lifts up the shelf and allows it to be moved, uh, attaches it to the robot. The robot can then carry it over to a station where a human can take the object off of the shelf uh, and place it in a bin where it can then be packed and, and shipped. Uh, to the person who's ordered it. Uh, and in this way, Amazon has simplified the problem of fully automating the warehouse, right? The warehouse is fully automated in the sense that it operates according to a rule. 
only get the items which someone has ordered and paid for um, and put them in that person's order and not someone else's order. Uh, these are rules the system is operating according to, but uh, driving around the warehouse uh, and picking up a shelf that the robot knows where the shelf is, the shelf can be marked underneath or have some uh, mechanical uh, device underneath that allows the robot to engage with it uh, in a safe and repeatable way. Uh, these are, are somehow more rule-like than the problem of finding an object on the shelf which might be in an unpredictable location or might not be obviously grippable uh, and give that problem to a human which we know can solve that problem uh, and that simplifies the amount of robotics work that they have to do to get the efficiency gains of automation in their system. Uh, of course, we wouldn't consider those robots to be any more intelligent than we would consider this robot. This robot sorts packages according to which carrier needs to carry them out of the warehouse. Uh, this is also in an Amazon distribution center. Um, uh, but this robot is purpose-built, it's stationary, uh, but it is no more intelligent than uh, the little cute orange robots that run around the factory floor and move the shelves around. Uh, it's, it's still uh, operating according to some rules. Um, and so that brings me to a, another point about automation, which is that automation changes the way that we break down uh, problems. Not only do we want to think about where is automation most useful within a problem, uh, but actually automation can change the paradigm in which we think about whether a problem can be solved and how a problem ought to be solved. So if you think about cargo shipping, prior to about 60 years ago, cargo shipping was done uh, mostly by humans in bulk carrier ships. Uh, so humans, stevedores, would carry the cargo into the ships or use uh, simple cranes to carry cargo into the ships or out of the ships. That meant that you had to have warehouses on the docks next to the ships. That meant that you couldn't carry the cargo very far once it got off the ships. It meant that the ships should dock uh, near urban centers where you could have a lot of stevedores, right? There were enough people to do this work. The people who were consuming the cargo were nearby. Uh, so you had ships in New York. You had ships in San Francisco and Boston and Baltimore. Uh, and today, uh, shipping looks a lot more like this. Um, and there is standardization and there are rules. And so here you see a rule which is embodied not in a mechanical device which moves or does anything as sophisticated as drawing a picture or pretending to play chess. Uh, this is a, a mechanical device which is just a 20-foot long steel box uh, that opens at both ends and you can load it up with cargo and you can pick it up and you can um, drop it on a, uh, a truck or a train or a ship and move it around uh, with a standard sized crane. Uh, this decouples the human work of packing and unpacking those containers so the warehouses can suddenly be far from the ships uh, because you can ship things intermodally. Uh, I should mention that this innovation uh, allows fewer stevedores to move a much, much larger volume and tonnage of cargo. Uh, right, so the number of stevedores in the world has gone down dramatically. Um, and uh, this is also a situation where the DOD has had a major impact. The first commercially successful commercial shipping company was called the Sea Land Corporation uh, because of the intermodal nature of containers. These three black cranes you see in the center of the image uh, at the Port of Oakland still today are the original Sea Land container cranes. Uh, sea Land developed this technology uh, in response to DOD needs and a large fraction of their early contracts were doing logistical support for the Korean and Vietnam Wars starting in the 1950s. Uh, and that technology moving from those beginnings uh, ended up taking over the entire global shipping industry and, and displacing the old mechanism. Uh, and uh, just another example of ways in which uh, automation changes the nature of a problem, sort of the flip side of the Amazon example, uh, is that if we think about what uh, automation will um, do the job of a train conductor who's walking through the train and checking your tickets, your credentials to be on the train, uh, well, a much easier way to do that in an automated uh, fashion is to have a fare gate uh, and to have people self-service uh, present their credentials. And so uh, here we've broken down the problem uh, in the opposite way. Automation has, has flipped around our view of the problem uh, and so um, if you open your favorite financial news and it says the robots are coming for your jobs, well, the jobs the robots are doing 
are not the same jobs the humans are doing. They're different jobs. Uh, so I, I promised at the beginning that I would talk a little bit about the law and legal scholarship and legal theory. Uh, and if you talk to legal scholars, especially legal theorists, they will talk about the rules versus standards debate. So if you have something you want done, we've talked about how automation operates according to rules. Uh, rules don't require any interpretation. You can just objectively apply a rule in the same way in each, ca in, in each case you come across. And that has huge advantages. You can operate rules very quickly. You can operate rules in very large numbers of cases. When you apply a rule, the application is consistent. It's reproducible. It's predictable for other people who can build their actions around what's going to happen in the rules. And that's because once you've specified what the rule is and promulgated that information to people, uh, if you know the facts in a particular case, you can apply the rule ahead of time and figure out what's going to happen. So you've predetermined the outcome. There is a rule in the US Constitution that says you must be at least 35 years old to become president. Uh, now that rule serves a certain goal, namely that presidents are, uh, you know, have enough life experience to do the job. Um, but there are other ways you could specify that goal. Uh, you could specify it as a standard. A standard is more flexible. It allows some discretion in its application. It requires some thinking about how to apply it. Uh, for that reason, standards require a decision maker. They require someone like a judge or an oversight entity to decide uh, how to apply them and when to apply them. Often standards in law come with mandatory what are called balancing tests, where there are specific things that you're supposed to weigh against specific other things. Uh, and those tests might be pre-specified as rules, but exactly how to apply those tests is not immediately clear. Uh, if you were presented with a test in a particular case, you need someone like a judge to do that interpretive work. Uh, and so a, a version of the rule from the Constitution stated as a standard is you must be sufficiently mature to become president. Uh, legal theorists also talk about principles. Principles are another kind of mandatory concern, something you have to apply in, in particular cases. Uh, in the law, a major principle in US law at least, uh, not in all legal systems, uh, is the uh, binding nature of decisions that have been made in the past. So precedent decisions that have been made in the past affect the space of possible decisions in the future. Uh, other kinds of principles, uh, no one should profit from their own misdeeds, no citizen ab is above the law. These are open-ended. Unlike a standard, a principle doesn't tell you how to go about uh, reasoning through how to apply it in a particular case. You have to figure that part out for yourself. It's very open-ended. Uh, this comes back to uh, machines and automation uh, in building machines uh, in lots of interesting ways. Uh, but I think a, a, an insightful example is to think, how would you build an automated speed camera? So suppose that you have a stretch of highway and the speed limit on this stretch of highway is 55 miles an hour. And you set up your automated speed camera and you set the threshold so it's going to identify people by their license plate and mail tickets to anyone who's traveling over 55 miles an hour because that's the law and that's what the system should do. Well, now someone who's driving very safely, but who happens to be driving at 56 miles an hour because of a calibration error of the machine or a gust of wind, uh, or they're passing someone who's driving unsafely, uh, they're going to get a ticket. Someone who's driving much slower, but very erratically, on the other hand, is not going to get a ticket. Uh, and so you have a, a problem where you have both false positives in the rule and false negatives in the rule, and that's always going to be uh, an issue when you've set up a, a set of rules. And so you could imagine a more complicated set of rules that tries to drive those uh, errors uh, out of the system as much as you can. Uh, and then you have just interpretive problems. So uh, if you look at the photo on the right is a photo of a speed limit that applies to tanks. And if you drive around, say, Germany near US installations, you'll often see uh, different uh, speeds posted for cars and for trucks and for tanks. So you'll see three speed limits on the road. Uh, and the question is, if you drive by uh, while operating an armored car, which has rubber wheels but armor like a tank, which speed limit do you, uh, do you obey? And which speed limit should the camera enforce? Uh, so here, the rules, as we've specified them, are somehow incomplete. Uh, and this leads me to talking about automation and failure. There are many situations where automation can fail. Uh, and there are two big ways that automations uh, can fail. Uh, if we think of automation as a process that runs according to a set of rules, uh, we could say the rules themselves are wrong. We've misspecified what the rules are supposed to be. So 
Um, maybe we set the speed limit incorrectly. The law says uh, that the speed limit on this road that we're thinking of is 55 miles an hour, but for some reason we got confused and we programmed into the speed camera 35 miles an hour. Um, so we've made a mistake in building our uh, embodiment of the rules by uh, misunderstanding uh, what the rules are. Uh, and, and that is sort of fits in, in lots of design errors. Uh, <coughs> Professor Denning suggested to me the example of the Vicennes in 1988 shooting down an Iranian uh, commercial airliner, uh, believing it to be a fighter jet because uh, the radar system that was in use on the ship um, reused identifiers. And so if there was a fighter jet and it went out of range of the radar system, the identifiers could be remapped onto existing objects or new objects in, uh, in that the radar system could see. Uh, and so although the radar system understood that the object uh, was a commercial airliner, uh, the fact of the reuse of identifiers might have confused the human operators enough to lead them to believe that it was still the fighter jet. Uh, and that could have led to the downing of the, the airliner. Uh, another kind of error that you have uh, is implementation error. So if you sort of stipulate to the idea that uh, the rules are correct and complete uh, and they cover all the cases we want them to, it can still be that the system we build is buggy. So maybe we set the speed camera to trigger at 55 miles an hour, but it happens that it triggers at 53 miles an hour because of a calibration error in the radar part of the speed camera or due to a software bug, uh, somehow it, it misfires some of the time. Uh, a famous example of an implementation error that comes from a piece of legal scholarship called Technological Due Process by Danielle Citron uh, is this computer welfare benefits determination system in Colorado that the state built in the 1990s, early 2000s. Uh, and it was meant to uh, streamline the operation of the state's welfare system. Uh, but what it did was it determined almost immediately that lots of people were not in fact eligible for benefits, when in fact they were, simply because the control tables in the benefits determination system had been misspecified by the programmers. Uh, so that's just an implementation error. Another way that automation fails is the connection between the automation and humans. There's a lecture later in the course on human machine teaming. Uh, but for right now, I want to talk about two kinds of uh, over-reliance on automation by humans. One is called automation dependency, which is that when you uh, have work taken away from humans by automating it, right? you take some thing that a human was doing, you build some automated system that does it, uh, the human is no longer doing that work. And so they, just, they don't practice it. They lose uh, the capability to sharpen their skills on that task. Uh, and so they become de-skilled. Now they might be re-skilled, they might learn new skills that relate to the existence of the automated system. They might be more powerful because of the existence of the automated system, right? Think back to the uh, people operating cargo uh, systems can handle a lot more cargo than stevedores could previously. But uh, the automation does take away your ability to practice certain skills. And so, well, I imagine that there are people in this room who know how to saddle a horse. I don't know how to saddle a horse. I, uh, I have a general sense for how it works, but if you gave me all of the equipment and a horse, I'm not totally convinced that I could do it or at least do it well. And that's just because we don't use horses to get where we're going anymore. We use other technology. Uh, another kind of uh, automation over-reliance is automation bias, uh, which is where humans uh, over-rely on information that comes out of automated systems, even when they shouldn't, and even when they have contradictory information available to them. So, I found a study looking at automation bias in many different fields, and one of the interesting results in it was doctors diagnosing breast cancer who were looking at mammograms, x-rays. Uh, when they just saw the x-rays, they would catch 46% of the cancers and diagnose them in the particular sample that these uh, authors had found. Um, and when they added a tool that gave some hints about whether there were cancers and where in the x-ray images the cancers were, the doctors, uh, you would think, oh, the hints will help the doctors. Well, the hints actually caused the doctors to go from diagnosing 46% of the cancers to diagnosing 21% of the cancers. Uh, and the reason for that is that the doctors were relying on the hints, even though they had the images available and could have made the same decisions and just ignored the hints, they didn't. They came to rely on the hints to say whether there was cancer in the image or not, uh, and uh, so they failed to identify the cancer uh, more often. And you could imagine that this is because the system that generated the hints just wasn't very good. 
um, and you could imagine that a better system might make the doctors better, but that's uh, still you know, something you would have to investigate. Uh, of course, there are real world consequences, not just sort of study consequences to uh, automation bias. This is a photo of the recovery of a piece of the tail section from Air France Flight 447, uh, which some of you may remember was lost in 2009 uh, en route from Rio de Janeiro to Paris. Uh, and it was lost for a fairly simple reason, that the airspeed sensors stopped giving reliable information after they were flying through a storm and the pitot tube took on ice. Um, and the, uh, the, the plane uh, in this mode decided to kick control back over to the pilots. But the pilots did not understand the operating mode that the, air, uh, the airliner was flying in and continued to give control inputs consistent with a different mode of operation of the plane. Uh, and this mode confusion led the pilots to act in a way that did not allow them to recover from the stall they were in, even though the plane was warning them of the stall for the entire three and a half minutes from the moment the uh, autopilot disengaged to the moment the plane hit the ocean. Uh, so if we want to think about how to build automated systems that we can rely on, we need to do a few things. We need to do some careful engineering to say what rules should these processes operate under. What are the specifications we need to have? To the extent that we can't have a specification, we need to have acceptance criteria for the system that tell us that we have actually captured a set of rules that are acceptable to us, that are fit for purpose, uh, that are complete and correct uh, for the purpose that we're putting the system to. Uh, that's particularly useful for machine learning, which you'll hear more about later in the course. Uh, of course, once we have set a set of rules or a set of acceptance criteria, uh, we still need to know that the systems we build match up to those, measure up to those requirements. So we need to do some careful testing or validation work to make sure that the automated systems we build uh, actually conform to the requirements we've set and that the requirements we've set conform to our expectations of the overall function of the system uh, as it's uh, deployed. Uh, doing that requires examining the full context of the system, uh, understanding not only the, uh, the automation, the rules, and their embodiment, uh, but the people who have discretion, who interact with that part of the system, and the policies and other norms that surround that system to control it. Um, and finally, because any set of rules is going to uh, have some errors, uh, you want to give some resolution path for those errors or some escalation path to deal with the fact that the system uh, might not get the right answer all of the time. Uh, and so what we see is that automation has trade-offs. Uh, there are some big benefits to automation, but they're not necessarily only benefits. And all of the benefits sort of come with some countervailing interest that um, makes them uh, less uh, you know, uh, immediately uh, adoptable. So for example, automation moves things much faster. It gives you a lot of speed and scale. Uh, but that speed and scale means that if you make a mistake, if you have some failure, that failure can propagate at speed and at scale. So you can harm a lot of people really fast. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, you can uh, think about, thinking about how to operate a process according to a set of rules means that you have to structure that process really carefully. Uh, but treating everyone according to rules means that you sort of take away people's ability to be treated in a particular case, uh, and that limits uh, people's autonomy, and it can also harm, uh, it also creates what uh, lawyers often refer to as dignitary harms, um, so uh, harms to human dignity. Uh, and that's not because you're, there's any dignitary difference between being treated by a machine and being treated by a human, but rather that treating people according to rules as opposed to their specific circumstances uh, affects how they feel about that treatment. Uh, and so uh, some of you may be familiar with an author by the name of Franz Kafka. Franz Kafka wrote a novel in 1914, well before uh, there was much uh, in the way of automation, about bureaucratic automation and the way that treating people according to rules uh, robbed them of their dignity. Uh, the novel is called The Trial. Uh, and so I'll conclude by saying that automation is very useful. It makes things faster. It uh, doesn't get tired. It doesn't lose focus. It doesn't uh, make capricious departures from rules. These are all problems with humans. Um, but uh, when we go into automation, we think automation should make things more reliable. Uh, in fact, automation just changes the shape and size of the reliability problem and sort of pushes it around. Uh, and often we think of uh, these tools in an AI course especially 
these automated tools as in some way being intelligent or representing or capturing human intelligence. But just like looms automated the uh, process of making cloth, which at one point was thought to require intelligence, um, these, the fact that we can do something according to a set of rules sort of means that it didn't require intelligence in the first place. And so when we deploy automation, we need to understand what we're deploying it for, how we're going to do it, and why we're going to do it, and what it takes to make that system trustworthy. Uh, and I'll take whatever uh, of the rest of the class uh, Peter is willing to give me uh, to take some questions, and, uh, and then we can let you go uh, on time. We have a few minutes. Thank you.